Hello, David, and, and thanks for joining me today. Uh, as we were discussing, uh, there was a recent article in law.com about the impact of the remote work environment and the predicted hybrid environment that's coming and how that's going to impact culture. And, and the thrust of the article was that it was going to impact it in a, in a negative way. And, and given the fact that you're a, a culture expert and, and have extensive experience working in the legal profession, what were your thoughts on, on that article? Yeah, yeah, I read the article. Um, I believe the author's name was Paul Hopkinson, I believe. Yeah. So uh, Paul made some good points in the article, right? I mean, you're right. The underlying hypothesis was that if if the new norm is that we're going to have either a full remote workforce or some kind of a hybrid you know, remote workforce, that it could be the beginning of the end of the sort of law firm culture that differentiates itself from competitors, right? right. So, so I have a I don't disagree with that necessarily, but you know, my one sort of like, you know, differing perspective is that that risk of kind of creating a culture that is indistinguishable from your competitors or from similar firms has always been here. Absolutely. Not, yeah, it's not this new risk that kind of popped up, you know, when we were kind of forced into our home offices. It's it's always been there. And and, and people like me who actually have, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if Paul has this experience at all, but, um, you know, who have led and continue to lead large scale culture initiatives, we know that that particular risk itself is a strong motivation for organizations to invest in intentional culture. Right. And uh, yeah, that very well said. And, and so David, when you say intentional culture, can you just elaborate a little bit more about what that means? Yeah, sure. So every organization, every firm has a culture, <laughs> whether they like it or not, right? If it's there. And, uh, and when you are not uh, proactively guiding and shepherding that sort of culture, right? And, and, and when I use the word culture, it's like, it's, you know, really getting clear about the behaviors and the norms and the values and the beliefs that permeate across the organization, right? Um, if you're not sort of focused on making sure that you are testing that to make sure it's continuing to help you execute against your strategy and achieve outcomes, uh, then what you essentially have is an unintentional culture. And unintentional cultures are a patchwork of things across the organization, right? Um, I always say, it, it's, it sounds pretty harsh, but I think there's some truth in that, is that unintentional cultures really are a reflection of the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. So those behaviors that we just sort of like turn our back to, we kind of tolerate it, those become uh, really the cultural norms across the organization. And I have yet to see an unintentional culture that actually helps a company facilitate success, right? It usually creates obstacles, challenges, setbacks. So when I say intentional culture, it is someone at the firm is responsible or people at the firm are responsible for clarifying what those values and beliefs are, translating that into tangible behaviors that you would expect to see um, uh, more often than not across an organization. Great. And, and, you know, I like the old adage, uh, if you don't pick your culture, culture is going to pick you, and it may not be the one you want. And, yeah. and, and in all these organizations and who try to implement a, a culture and these core values, accountability is the most important aspect of, of making sure that people are complying with the culture. And you know, I, and, you know, Paul's article um, put an emphasis on the remote and hybrid work environment. So my, my question is, does having a, a law firm with a, a, a hybrid model where there's dedicated employees who work in the office, dedicated employees who work remotely, and then a hybrid of people who are going to come in uh, on a fixed number of days per week, does that make it more difficult to have an intentional culture? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a tricky one, right? Because I, I think that remote working, especially when we were kind of you know, sort of suddenly forced into that environment, it did create challenges in terms of how we communicate, how we stay connected, uh, dissemination of information, you know, sort so of those tactical things, right? But again, if we think about what culture is and kind of how it 
is sustained, right? So an intentional culture in particular. So I, I know in the article that Paul wrote that we're referencing today, you know, he talked a bit about some of those visual cues of sort of cultural rituals, right? He mentioned like, you know, who's gonna bring the birthday cake into the office for to celebrate someone's birthday, right? The dress code that kind of dictates how you should kind of show up and behave. And that, being able to pop into somebody's office. And that's not where culture gets its oxygen, right? It's not where it's sustained. Um, those are interesting perks, and it certainly adds to the, uh, a firm's value proposition, right? Um, and uh, and it could be uh, a draw for somebody to come in if those are, those are uh, rituals that you know, the firm's engaged in. But culture really it it lives in the minds of the employees and uh, and uh, you know associates and partners that, that work at the firm, um, and it's also articulated in the behaviors, right? And so I always say, it's not what a firm does or what firm leaders do, it's how they do it. And so as it relates to the remote working environment, whether it's a hybrid scenario or whether you have some people permanently in the office or something, regardless, <clears throat> it requires firm leaders to understand how the work needs to get done in this new environment. So the what probably doesn't shift. You still have to service clients. You still have to make money, right? You still have to create proposals. You still have to do business development. All those things still have to happen, but how you do it might need to shift to uh, accommodate uh, um, uh, to a, a remote or a hybrid working environment. And uh, so, so when we think about as an example, I mean, let's, let's use our firm as an example, right? We have a strongly held belief that's part of our culture that every organization has an opportunity to reach its fullest potential. And we have the expertise and the skill and the tools to be able to help them get as close to that threshold, if not reach it entirely. We believe that, right? right. And, uh, and because of that belief, we've kind of aligned around a set of core values. We you know, are intimately passionate about intellectual curiosity about collaboration, about diversity of thought, so diversity and inclusion, right? Yeah. These are really, really important to us. And because those are important values for us, we've translated those into activities and norms that we, we see all the time, David, right? So, you know, we are always reading articles, right? That's why we're on the call today, right? right. We're yeah. about the content. We're talking and, and, about and, and I want to thank Paul for uh, writing a, a thought-provoking article. Yeah, definitely, yeah. right? So, so we're engaged in behaviors that are a representation of that intellectual curiosity, right? You and I, you know, we collaborate all the time. We're pulling other people's perspectives in, right? I'm not afraid of being challenged, right, in a conversation. So so those are the behaviors that are manifested, uh, manifestations of the strongly held beliefs and values that we have as part of our culture. That hasn't changed over the past year. We haven't been in physical proximity for over a year now. Right. But we still... We're still engaged in activities around intellectual curiosity. We're still in, you know, engaged in collaboration. Uh, we're still inviting you know, wide perspective of insight and voices to the table when we're having conversations. None of that has shifted in the remote work environment. Yeah. And so, so I disagree with Paul a little bit that, that, uh, that you, you can't reestablish um, uh, how the work gets done while still respecting and celebrating the unique culture that firm brings to the table. Right. It, there just has to be a commitment and, and accountability to achieve that. And so, you know, David, you just threw a lot of, a lot of concepts and, and values out there. And for some people, it could be a, a little overwhelming. And when we think about managing partners and strategic leadership teams of law firms, you know, their focus is on providing great service to their clients, being great lawyers, and, and focusing on the business model. What advice would you give to somebody uh, in those leadership positions to now start to focus on building that intentional culture in a hybrid environment when you know, for, for a lot of large firms over the past 50 years, they've been exclusively an in-person law firm. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question in a second. I wanna go back to the intentional culture piece because it's, sure. it's really important. So, you know, I, it's not uncommon for me to be engaged in a conversation with a management partner or a CEO and, and, uh, and they're like, what, why, what's the point? Like, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's the value of me, you know, um, Assembling some team and throwing some money, <laughs> and right. and, uh, and so what 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 they're what they're often missing is the 
the efficiency that a, their firm realizes when they focus on an intentional culture. In the absence of an intentional culture, what are you holding people accountable for in terms of behavior and how they're showing up and uh, and their their responsibility in building an environment where everybody can thrive, right? How do you hold someone accountable when there's that ambiguous target, right? So, so in an intentional culture, it becomes far more easy to look at the entire employee life cycle, how you recruit and onboard, how you compensate, how you manage performance, how you promote people, how, how you, you train and develop, how you thank people, how you demonstrate care, and even how you offboard people. Yeah. All that becomes much easier to understand you know, what's fractured, what needs to be uh, modified. So they're all working in coordination and reinforcing that culture that you're trying to establish or trying to sustain. So um, it becomes a, a nearly impossible task if you don't have that clarity. So that's why I'm a big fan of the in intentional culture. Um, the advice I would give to you, um, whether it's a managing partner or, or a leader, if, you know, there's lots of people who are not, not in positions of broad authority, who are curious about, you know, what they can do around culture. If you're not the managing partner or the CEO, I would, my first piece of advice is get that buy-in. It's not that you can't achieve some progress or make some benefits, you know, from incorporating or initiating some culture work deeper in the firm, but you really do need that support and that buy-in at the very top of the organization. It's it, it just far easier to get, you know, the, the progress you need. The second, the second piece of advice is don't underestimate the value of sort of sitting in that discovery space for the appropriate amount of time. You know, really understanding what should we be focused on to differentiate our firm from our competitors, right? What, you know, who do we, who, what legacy do we want to leave, right? What's the, what's that, what's that feeling we want people to be left with when they engage with our firm, right? Don't underestimate the time required to get, you have to get that right. And if you rush through it and you don't get it fully articulated then everything else that comes after that will not be optimized either, right? So, um, and oftentimes I see, you know, organizations, just really fly through that that part of the of, of the process. So I would really be patient around that. I guess the third piece of advice would be to set really clear expectations of what's possible over a certain amount of time. You know, I mean, I know you've been part of these conversations before, where, hey, uh, I need your help, uh, and I need all this done by the next quarter. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, 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 hold up. You know, it's um, you know, we always say, listen. Your firm went on a journey to get where it is today, and it's going to take another journey to get where you want it to go. So, you know, acknowledge and respect that, um, and uh, and you know, set realistic expectations because these things are challenging. I always say to my clients, these are never linear. They're always sort of a you know uh, you know zipping around in a variety of activities. So you have to just acknowledge that it's it's not this sort of clean straight trajectory. That um, you know these things can be very uh, very challenging, um, uh, especially if you're looking to get uh, results quickly. David, this has been great. You know how much I love having these conversations with you, and 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 uh, thanks to Paul Atkinson for starting this conversation. And uh, you know, we hope to engage others about it, and we welcome feedback uh, with respect to our opinions and what we said today. And and we look to have a thoughtful and inclusive dialogue. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's, it's you know, if, if folks are listening or watching the video and they have questions about what they can be doing around workplace culture or they want to kind of like have a thought partner to kind of test out what they're doing, like we're always available. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know uh, reach out to us and uh, we'd love to have a chat. Thank you so much and be well. Yeah, good, definitely.